Okay, okay, I guess we've got enough people here to make a start now. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, today about uh, a civilian transformation, that means the formation of ferrite. And when this ferrite grows, there is no shape deformation other than a volume change. Okay, so it, the formation of this ferrite involves a lot of diffusion, sufficient diffusion to eliminate any shape change. It's much closer to an equilibrium transformation than all the other reactions we've discussed, for example, Martinside, Bainite, and Wiedenstein. Now, this ferrite forms uh, at temperatures close to the equilibrium temperature, and the easiest place for nucleation to happen is a, an austenite grain boundary, parent grain boundary, because when you nucleate something on a boundary, let's imagine this is a grain boundary between austenite grains, if you get something on the boundary, then in the process you eliminate some of that boundary. So that's a gain in energy because the boundary is a defect. And that's the reason why heterogeneous nucleation is much easier than homogeneous nucleation, where nucleation happens inside the perfect crystal. So the first place where ferrite nucleates is at an austenite grain boundary. And of course, diffusion is also easier along the grain boundary because there's a lot of free volume at the grain boundary. The atoms don't know whether they belong <coughs> to one grain or the other. And therefore the growth rate along the boundary is faster than growth in a normal direction. So the shape in which this ferrite grows is really a reflection of the boundary rather than of the crystallography. And that's why this kind of ferrite is known as allotriomorphic ferrite. And allotriomorph it, it comes from the Greek, meaning that the shape of that ferrite does not reflect its crystalline symmetry. You can see here, basically, it's grown along the grain boundary. There's nothing to indicate that it's got a body-centered cubic structure or crystallographic facets of any kind. So, ferrite which grows at the austenite grain boundaries is known as a ferrite, and it grows rapidly along the boundary so that eventually you can treat its growth basically as one-dimensional thickening, normal to the boundary plane. By contrast, if you nucleate the ferrite inside the grain, perhaps on a non-metallic inclusion present in the steel, uh, we call it idiomorphic ferrite because it has some aspect of the crystallography of the ferrite. You can see these crystallographic facets. And these grains tend to be more equiaxed, that means the same roughly the same dimensions in all directions. And from a mechanical property point of view, this is a good microstructure to have <coughs> compared with this, because uh, basically there is no microstructure inside these regions, and therefore cracks are difficult to deflect. Whereas here, the propagating crack will encounter many different grains in different crystallographic orientations. So sometimes, in steels, we deliberately add non-metallic inclusions, controlled additions, to stimulate the formation of ferrite grains inside the austenite grain, uh, parent austenite grains. Okay. So idiomorphic, again, is from the Greek, meaning that its shape has some relationship to the crystalline symmetry. We have crystallographic facets. So here, for example, is an idiomorph of ferrite, and you can see that there are some crystallographic facets on that grain. And this is an example of a lotriomorphic ferrite basically growing along the grain boundary, but you can then treat its growth as being one-dimensional, normal to the grain surface. Everyone happy with that? Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, this is just another example of an allotriomorphic ferrite, and you can see it's grown rapidly along the austenite grain boundary, and subsequent growth basically is normal to that boundary plane. So what we are going to do is derive an equation for the growth rate of that layer of ferrite. And it's very convenient because it's just one dimensional growth. And I'm going to make some simplifications um, basically to make the mathematics simple without losing any of the physics. Right, so the first thing is that supposing I have an alloy of composition C bar, that's the carbon concentration, and I supercool it to this temperature, then 
the equilibrium composition of the ferrite is given by C <coughs> alpha gamma, where this is the composition of the ferrite which is in equilibrium with austenite. And this is the composition of the austenite which is in equilibrium with the ferrite. So that's the terminology that I'm going to use. When I say alpha gamma, it means the composition of alpha which is in equilibrium with gamma. And similarly, this is the composition of gamma in equilibrium with alpha. And this is the average concentration of carbon we have in our material. Anybody know what this line is called here? The line connecting C alpha gamma and C gamma alpha? Tie line. It's a tie line of the equilibrium phase diagram. So it connects equilibrium compositions here and here. And this, of course, is the alpha <coughs> gamma phase field. Just to remind you, this is from the iron carbon phase diagram. And we are looking at these two phase boundaries here. Now, one important thing you see from here is that the ferrite has a much lower solubility for carbon than the austenite. You can see this is the solubility of carbon in ferrite and in austenite. So when we grow ferrite, we are going to have to reject carbon. <coughs> carbon has to diffuse ahead of the interface. So if I plot a concentration profile at the ferrite austenite interface, so this is the position of the interface, Z star gives me the position of the interface, then the composition of the ferrite will be less than C bar and the equilibrium composition of the austenite will be greater than C bar. So as the ferrite grows we are pushing carbon ahead of the interface and that's why we have this concentration distribution ahead of the alpha gamma interface. Now I am going to say that this is a constant gradient here to simplify the math. In principle, it will be an error function distribution. But the final equations we derive, we won't lose any of the physics involved in the growth of that ferrite. So it's not really important that it's an error function distribution or a constant gradient here. We will capture the growth rate in terms of the diffusion coefficient, the phase diagram, and time. OK, so as this ferrite grows, we are building up carbon in the austenite. Z star is the position of the interface and delta Z here is the distance to which we have enriched the austenite with carbon. So just to show you the relationship with the phase diagram, at this interface, the alpha and gamma are in equilibrium because the composition here is given by this end of the tie line and the composition here is given by this end of the tie line. Right. Now, this is the concentration distribution at the time t. And as the ferrite grows by a small amount, that distribution shifts to that red diagram. And in that process, in going from here to here, as the interface advances from here to here, that much carbon has been pushed. So the rate at which solute is partitioned is C gamma alpha minus C alpha gamma times the rate at which the interface moves. Is that fairly clear? That the rate at which solute partitions is the difference in the composition of the gamma and the alpha times the Z star by dt, which is the velocity of the interface. Now that carbon has to be carried away by diffusion. That carbon that we have pushed ahead of the interface has to be carried away by diffusion. In other words, the flux of carbon down this gradient. So that diffusion flux is simply given by fixes first law of diffusion, so we have the diffusion coefficient times the gradient of carbon, 
Now it's convenient that in our case that gradient is constant. But the main point is that the rate at which we are partitioning solute must equal the rate at which we are carrying it away by diffusion in order to maintain C alpha gamma and C gamma alpha constant. In order to maintain these values constant, the rate at which we are pushing solute must be equal to the rate at which you are carrying it away. So we immediately have one equation defining the growth process, that the rate of solid partitioning must equal the diffusion flux from the interface. Yeah? And because of the assumption of a constant gradient, we can write dc by dz in terms of c gamma alpha minus c bar divided by this distance delta z. Everyone happy with that? <coughs> now, we know the diffusion coefficient from diffusion experiments. We know the phase diagram. We don't actually know the value of delta z. We don't know how far the carbon has diffused. We need another equation to solve for the growth rate. Any ideas? How I can get another equation which will help me to solve for delta z? Diffusion. Sorry? But how far the, the carbon in the uh, gamma can diffuse in unit time? Yeah, you, you could actually use a simple calculation like root dt, something like that. Yeah. Uh, but that would be a random walk process, whereas we are actually partitioning well, if carbon you know gradient. gradient. If you know that gradient already, can't you just use trigonometry and find delta z? But we don't know it, you see, because we don't know delta z. But we know the y-axis and we know the yeah. hypoxin. Right, we, we know the difference between this point and this point. Yeah. Yeah. And we know the angle of the line. No, we, yeah. we don't know that, you see. We don't know delta z. So, so using the random book would give you a rough idea. Yeah. But this is directed diffusion. So if, if you take the area under that slope line, mm -hmm. it should equal the area of the, the part that's already been um, solidified or whatever. So yeah. 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 So we, we are going to use a mass balance. Yeah, because we know that the total amount of carbon that has been added to the austenite must equal the total amount of carbon that is not in the ferrite compared with C bar. In other words, this area here must equal this area here. Okay, so the carbon rejected from the ferrite must equal the carbon that's enriched in the austenite. So conservation of mass tells us that the area of this rectangle here, which is C alpha gamma minus C bar times the thickness of the ferrite, <coughs> must equal C gamma alpha minus C bar, which is this one, uh, times delta z times half because it's a triangle. Yeah, base times height. Half base times height. So this is simply mass conservation. So we now have two equations. Yeah. The first, balancing the rate at which solute is partitioned with <coughs> the diffusion flux from the interface. And the second, mass conservation. So if I substitute for delta z into this equation, I should be able to derive the growth rate in terms of the phase diagram and the diffusion coefficient. Okay. And when I rearrange, um, all I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute for delta z over here rearrange that equation and you get dz star by dt as a function of the diffusion coefficient, the average concentration of carbon in your steel, the equilibrium concentration in the austenite, the equilibrium concentration in the ferrite, and this is the thickness of that ferrite. So obviously if I take z star onto the other side, then I have a z star dz star by dt, don't I? So when I integrate that, 
I'm going to get z star being proportional to the square root of time, or z squared being proportional to time. So what we are saying is that the thickness of the ferrite will vary with the square root of time. So this is uh, z star and time. The curve will look something like this. A parabolic relationship between z star and t. So z star is proportional to t. Ah, sorry, square root of t. Now, of course, the slope of that is the growth rate in z star by dt. So what this is saying is that the growth rate is decreasing as the ferrite thickens. Any ideas why it should decrease? Exactly right. So as the ferrite grows, you've got greater enrichment of the austenite. So the carbon diffusion field is over a longer distance. And therefore, the gradient is less, and therefore, the growth rate slows down. So, here's another analogy. Imagine ice forming on the surface of a pond. Okay? That ice thickens by the diffusion of heat through the ice to the surface. Right? So, as the ice gets thicker, you've got a larger diffusion distance, and therefore, the thickening rate slows down. So, this is uh, parabolic thickening, and in that equation, you see, we don't just have time, we have absolutely everything about your steel. You have the diffusion, diffusion coefficient, okay. you've got the average composition, you've got the phase diagram information. So you can happily do calculations of the growth rate as a function of the carbon concentration, for example, the average carbon concentration of your material. Uh, you can lump all those terms, the diffusion coefficient, phase diagram, C bar, into a constant which is known as the one-dimensional parabolic thickening rate constant. But that's, that's not an important statement. It's often written like that, and that's why I'm telling you. The details of alpha 1 you've already derived. <coughs> if, if you had avoided the assumption of a constant gradient, you wouldn't have got a different relationship. Yeah? There would be just a, a very small differences in terms of the mathematical form. What is Q? Q oh, sorry, Q is Z star. Okay. Um, I should change that. Be consistent. I pulled that slide from another piece of work. Okay. And of course, the reason why growth rate slows down is that when I've got a small amount of ferrite, I've got a small amount of carbon enrichment in the austenite and this gradient is steep. As my ferrite becomes thicker, this gradient becomes gentler. So the diffusion process slows down and that's why you've got parabolic thickening instead of a constant growth rate. Yeah. So in any case, in any example where the diffusion distance increases as the product phase thickens, you will get a slowing down of growth rate. So for example, when you put solder onto copper, there's a reaction between the copper and the solder, and the thickness of that reaction layer will vary with square root of time. If you look at the oxidation of copper, you've got uh, oxide building up on the copper, the oxygen has to diffuse through the oxide to get to the copper, and therefore the thickening rate is parabolic with time. The thickness of the oxide is parabolic with time. Of course, if the oxide breaks off, that changes. Okay? But while the oxide is connected to the surface, it's parabolic with time. And many, many examples like this. And it's not at all surprising that you should get a square root term appearing, because you remember that uh, the random walk distance is proportional to square root of time, isn't it? Okay. okay. What, what I'm going to do is just just to lead you on to the next lecture. Okay. Now, this diagram is for a binary system. 
we have iron and carbon. And this die line is obtained by drawing a common tangent to the free energy curves of alpha and gamma. And if I do this for many different temperatures, then I get those two phase boundaries when I plot this and this as a function of temperature. Supposing we go to a more complicated system, which is not binary, but it is ternary, so iron, manganese, carbon. Then each of these curves becomes a free energy surface, doesn't it? Because I can plot manganese along this axis, and you've got a free energy surface instead of a free energy curve. And that surface uh, is hard to draw, but imagine this is in three dimensions, okay? So this is a surface, and instead of a common tangent, you would have a common tangent plane. See? And wherever it touches those two surfaces, gives you a tie line on your ternary phase diagram. So we've got iron, we've got carbon, and we've got something else. But because it is ternary, we have an extra degree of freedom. So at a constant temperature, I can rock that plane and still touch both those surfaces, right? So I generate a whole phase field of tie lines. So I can have alpha and gamma of different compositions in equilibrium at the same temperature. Yeah. So imagine you have uh, two surfaces like this, and I put a tangent plane on it, I can rock it, can't I? Yeah, so it, it, the two points where the tangent plane touches the surfaces are not unique. So you can generate a whole phase field of alpha and gamma at a constant temperature. So my question is, in the case of a binary diagram, if I form ferrite at this temperature, I know exactly what the composition will be at the interface. It will be C alpha gamma and C gamma alpha. What happens when I have a ternary? How do we choose? which tie line out of the infinite set of tie lines that are here determine the compositions at the interface. Okay, so for the ternary case, I don't have just one profile. Set star, set star. So I will have the carbon concentration being plotted here and manganese concentration being plotted here. I not only have the equilibrium carbon concentration in the I also have the equilibrium manganese concentration. So I will have two diffusion profiles to cope with, plus I don't know which tie line out of that infinite set of tie lines should really determine these points. And remember, a real alloy will have maybe 20 different elements in it. Okay? So what we are going to do in the next lecture is deal with that problem. Has everybody... Uh, okay, so this is just showing the isothermal section uh, at a constant temperature, uh, carbon, manganese, and you have lots of tie lines at a constant temperature. Notice these tie lines are not radiating from the corner, they are determined by putting the tangent plane in contact with the free energy surfaces. Okay. So, to give you a clue, uh, instead of one equation for, the, for balancing the rate at which solute is partitioned against the diffusion flux from the interface, we will have two equations, one for the carbon, one for the manganese. And we've got to solve those simultaneously. And when we do that, we will find a unique tie line. We'll deal with this in the next lecture. Okay. Any questions? But for the binary, it's straightforward, isn't it? Okay. Well, you'll see that it's not that complicated for the ternary either. Okay. And there is a whole uh, whole structure that exists, you know, international cooperation. It's called CALFAD, Computer Calculation of Phase Diagrams. Everybody cooperates to provide data 
and you have the best methods of doing phase diagram calculations. Do you have any questions? So I have just one final point. Now, this is a ternary phase diagram. And, you know, I can say that, look, for this particular composition, I will have graphite, body center cubic iron, and this carbide phase. And by looking at this in detail, I can say how much of each of those phases I will have available, and the chemical compositions of those phases. So the information that I get from a phase diagram is, number one, the equilibrium compositions, Number two is the quantity of each phase that's present. Or each phase. And I can do that simply by looking at this diagram and saying, look, this is the equilibrium composition of the ferrite and this is the composition of the carbide. And if my alloy is located here, then I can work out how much of this there is and how much of the other phase there is. Now, supposing I had four elements, how would I draw the diagram? You see, this is an isothermal plot at a particular temperature and at a particular pressure. So if I wanted to alter the temperature, this would become like a prism. Yeah. Really complicated looking beast. And that's just three elements. What if I had four elements? How would I plot it? And then, you know, if you can answer that for me, then I would ask you, how would you plot five? <laughs> yeah? And so on. Well, I think you have to forget about making plots, because this is the information that you're after. Yeah? There's no need for you to draw any diagrams. You simply get a table of the equilibrium compositions of every phase that exists, and the amount of each phase that exists. Okay. In fact, if you try to draw diagrams even for the ternary system, you will frequently make mistakes. You will violate certain thermodynamic rules and so forth. So my recommendation is forget about drawing diagrams. This is the information we are after. Okay. Any questions? Okay, see you next time.